Yo, what's going on, Hope Nation? Do me a favor, y'all coming on in. Come on in, come on in, come on in. As you're coming in, don't forget to drop a line. Let me know uh, who's online with us, who's streaming with us live this Sunday morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Yeah, come on, let me know where you're coming from, where you're tuning in from. That's what's up. That's what's up. I only drop it in the chat. Good morning. What's up, T? As y'all coming in, also, don't forget to like. Don't forget to tag. Don't forget to share. What's up, Bree? What's up, Nisi Poo? Uh, go ahead and let people know that we are live. We are on the air. Um, once again, hope is on the air. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Do that. Well, we, I get a couple of things together because we're going to. Um, get ready to take up our offering right at the top so that I don't forget because, you know, y'all yeah, know sometimes I can get, you know, kind of get into it and I'd be forgetful sometimes. And so, uh, yeah, so we're going to get ready to do that. If you got your seed ready, um, don't forget here at New Hope, we speak to our seed. But as always, don't forget, uh, we have a few ways that you can give. Uh, if you if you have your, I'm sure you watch me streaming, so you can give online at www.nhccc. What's up, Reggie? Uh, Deacon Reggie in the house. Uh, you can give online at www.nhccc.org. Uh, if you need to mail in a check or money order, you can send us a check or money order to uh, make sure you make it out to New Hope Covenant Church and send it to P.O. Box 873. Two zero again. That's eight seven three two zero, and that's in Chicago, Illinois six zero six. You know, look. Let me make sure I say that right. Chicago, Illinois, right? No S, people. No, no Illinois. Even you know, you don't say the S. It's silent. Um, Chicago, Illinois six zero six uh, eight zero. Um, but then, also, if you have the the app, um, Givelify, you can give online at Givela app. Simply look up. Uh, New Hope Covenant Church. That's an app that a lot of other churches use. So you may have that app, may have used that app uh, at another church. And so simply type in New Hope Covenant Church and you can give that way. Um, also, uh, here in New Hope, we speak to our seed. Uh, as always, you all can repeat after me. I'm a tither and a giver. I'm blessed above measure. I have more than enough. I'm living in my overflow. I'm out of debt. All my needs are met. And I have plenty more to put in store. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, I'm so excited. As you all are coming in, don't forget to share this post. Uh, let folks know hope is on the air. Uh, even tag some people in the comments. Let them know. Um, you know, it's easy to tag folks. You know, put the at symbol. What's up, Elder Nicole? Let them know that we are on. As a matter of fact, even now, no matter where you are, some people might be in a car. Somebody, might, some people might be, you know, you might be taking a walk along the along the beach right now, along the, the lake, right? You know, because it's supposed to be real nice out. Um, go ahead and take a selfie. Go ahead and take a ussy. You know, if you with some other people, go ahead and take a selfie, take a ussy, and make sure that you share that post. Um, and, and, and use the hashtag hashtag Hope Nation, right? Let folks know that even on this glorious, especially on this glorious Sunday morning, that you still tuned in. There's still hope that God is still on the throne. He still reigns supreme. Let folks know that we are alive and we are worshiping God on this Sunday morning. As always, if you're not following our social media uh, pages here at New Hope, uh, make sure you look us up on at New Hope Chicago. Um, and then obviously on Facebook new hope covenant uh dash chicago and then of course if you haven't subscribed to our youtube channel make sure you go and find new hope covenant church uh on the on youtube amen listen as always you all uh make sure we send it up prayers for our pastor um i always thank god for our pastor anytime y'all always hear me say it i'm gonna continue to say it what's up sis what's up susan um anytime uh, God, uh, our pastor allows me to share the word with you all, right? You know, I never take it for granted because as always, I understand they're going to be held accountable for anything I say, any foolishness, any, any, whatever that I say. And so, uh, 
Lord knows I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, I'm saying the right things. I'm saying what thus said the Lord and that I make my path. I don't know about y'all, but, I'm, you know, I'm old school. I still want to make my pastor proud, right? You know, as much, I do want to hear the Lord say well done um, when we get, when I get there, right, on that great day, but not today. Um, but I do want to hear my, my pastor say well done. Anytime I fill in for a pastor, you know, although I don't do it for the applause, uh, it's just something about when your shepherd, when your leader says, you know what, I see something in you, great job, good job, kudos, they give you that that pat on the back. And and, and not to say that it has to be done all the time, but uh, I never take that for granted, you all. And for me, I'm, I'm going to speak for me. Anytime my pastor asks me to speak uh, on his behalf or in his place, I take that as a pat on the back. I take that that not only does he trust me, Right, that he believes that I'm capable. He believes that I'm actually connected to the God that I say that I serve. And so I'm always grateful to continue to pray for him, continue to lift him up um, as always. And also, you all, don't forget that if you want to give a, a love offering, huh, let me see if I got it up here. If you still want to give a look, even though he ain't preaching, you know, we can still give our love offerings, right? Um, because God is still good and our past is still our past. There it is. And if you want to send a love offering, you can send it to his cash app, which is dollar sign Quentin Mumphrey, right? Dollar sign Quentin Mumphrey is his cash app. So feel free to still show him some love. You know, I mean, it's good to hear it, but it's even better when people show it, right? I don't know. Again, it's dollar sign Quentin Mumphrey. I mean, I'm just being honest. I love it when people tell me I love them. they love me, right? But it, it, it's just something about when people show it. You know, it, it makes it a little more believable when people tend to show me that they love me more than they say it. I, I mean, come on, somebody. I mean, I know maybe it's just me, but, you know, I'm just saying, y'all know I'm going to keep it real. But, um, yeah, I'm as always, as I stated, I'm so excited. Let me turn this music off. Um, and, and, and I do believe that there's a word from the Lord on today. Um, you know, when Pastor let me know that he wanted me to uh, step in and, and, and preach for uh, and speak for us on today, I immediately, you know, began to ask the Lord, um, what is it that he would want me to say? You know, it, it's so often um, as a preacher, you know, not just as a pastor, but just as a preacher, uh, it's easy to to get in the vein of and, and believe that uh, every thought that we have uh, is of God, right? Um, and so it, it's very, especially when we're always reading the word and we may have certain topics and ideas and thoughts and, and God does use those things, but we still uh, have to go to God in prayer to specifically find out what is it that he wants to say Watch this to his people. Right. Because as much as I love y'all and as much as I love our pastor and, and those of us that are members of New Hope, uh, our pastor and any pastor is just the manager uh, uh, of a said church. Right. Of a business uh, because this is God's house. And so at the end of the day, anything that we say, uh, we sh and when we say on the behalf of God, we have to be sure and be certain that what we are speaking is actually uh, what God has to say. And sometimes it's not always comfortable. Sometimes it's not always, doesn't always feel good to us. And, and But I do believe you all that on today, I'm not going to hold us long. That's the goal, not to hold us long. But I do believe that today, you all, uh, God has a word for us. So uh, if you have your Bibles while we getting ready, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Second uh, Chronicles um, chapter 24. Um, Second Chronicles chapter 24, there's about 30, 27 verses uh, in the, the book of uh, Second Chronicles chapter 24. We're going to do a lot of reading today. Um, I am going to skip around just a little bit just for the sake of time, but we will be doing um, some reading. So as you all are getting ready, if you got your, you know, whether you got your hard Bible, you know, your big black book or the white book, whichever, you know, that one from the living room or if you're on your phone, um, put you can go, turn to Second Chronicles, uh, chapter twenty-four. I will be reading when we start reading. Uh, I will be reading from the New Living Translation, uh, only because that particular version uh, uh, has a, a, it helps me to uh, break things down a little bit easier uh, on this morning. 
Um, and just just a sad note, uh, I want to just remind some of us not to always get caught up in the King James Version, right? Um, not to say that you have to listen to every and, and read every specific um, translation, but sometimes it is really good to read some of the other, read the King James Version, right? But then use one of the other translations to help maybe break down or help you to really understand and comprehend uh, what the word is saying, right? We have to get, we have to grow beyond uh, feeling like we're too good and, and be being so religious that, right, we only read the King James Version knowing good and well, most of the time, you know, we don't even understand most of the this, thus, and thou um, that the King James Version is saying, right? And so I'm not discrediting the King James Version. I'm simply saying uh, God has given us other tools, you all. And so on this Christian journey that we are on, uh, he also gives us other versions to help. Yeah, that's another one, the ESV. Um, but he gives us different versions to help us to understand. And for me personally, what I'll do is I may start with the King James Version, and then I'll actually go and look at that same text in other translations just to make sure that what I might think something is saying that is actually saying that. And oftentimes, um, <laughs> I just read the last part, the ESV is the Lord's Version. <laughs> I got you, Kel the Crystal. Um, but the thing is, you all, uh, it, and I got to be honest and transparent as I'm getting ready to jump into our word. Uh, it does us no good to read uh, the book of the Bible and not comprehend it. It does us, it, it literally does us no good having read the words in the on the pages of a book and not understand anything that we read. Right. It, it, it then all we all we're doing is just simply reading a book, which is why most of us uh, probably st still struggle even after being in church all this time. That's why many of us still struggle because we read the this is the thus is the thou's and, and it's almost like reading Macbeth or something one of those you know something like that that's considered a classic. But if I don't really understand what I'm reading, it's boring. But when I tell you all. When, it, when you get the right, when you get to understanding what the Bible is actually saying, uh, it's it's just, I, I mean, I'm, when I tell y'all, there's so many movies that can be written, so many drama, to, uh, uh, drama to, dramatizations on TV that can be written based on the Bible when you really read what it's saying. But for so all, but I think oftentimes we don't read it. Uh, we read it as if it's so, and expecting some sort of magic glow, something to pop up off the page. When the reality is, uh, when we read the Bible, the Bible is telling us uh, stories of real life people, right, and their experiences. And for some reason, I think that when we read the Bible, we forget that the people that we're reading about, they didn't know. They didn't have a book of the Bible that they were reading at the time, right? They did have the sacred scrolls, but they're living this thing out in real life, right? And so even today, the text that we're going to get into, I'm gonna have, at some point, I'm going to have to try and uh, uh, give us a little background to help us to understand some of where, where I'm going, uh, to, just to give a little context. And I got to be honest, you know, I, I, for, I'm, and I'm speaking for me personally, right? Because as I began to do more research, it started to take me down what preachers know as a rabbit hole. And I ain't going to lie, the rabbit hole was entertaining. Right. And to the point that I was like, OK, I, I, I need to give a little bit of background. But some of this background is so good. Like, I really want to share it. But but I only need a little bit of it. But it's so good. Right. I mean, cause I'm, I'm talking about I was in I was enthralled in that thing. Like I was watching, you know, Scandal or one of those TV shows because it was so good. Once you begin to uncover this and uncover that. And so, again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and go with me to Second Chronicles. Uh, chapter 24, um, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 25, and then we'll jump around. But just to get things started, you all, um, I was uh, at the pastor told me that he or asked me to preach for us. Uh, there was a song that came to mind uh, after I began to pray. There was a song, there's a song uh, back in 1976, Andre Crouch uh, wrote a song called Soon and Very Soon. Anybody know that song? 
soon and very soon. Uh, we are going to see the king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 I mean, that's old school traditional hymn. You know, uh, Andre Crouch wrote this song. And and the thing, you all, that the first thing that came to mind uh, as as he began to sing the song, uh, the, the the thought came to mind heaven, right? Because at the end of the day, of uh, what he's referring to when he says soon and very soon, we're going to sing, going to see the king. He's actually referring to uh, when we uh, another, which another hymn came to mind, when we all get to heaven, you know. And so, y'all know me, and, and the more I began to meditate and think about that thing, um, I began to think about all of the. The, the people who uh, are excited about going to heaven. I, and I'm going to be honest, I'm excited about going to heaven. I, anybody else in the comments, talk to me, y'all. Anybody else excited about going to heaven? Anybody, anybody? You know, I, I mean, I, maybe it's just me. Um, but I know I, I, I'm excited about the idea of going to heaven, you all. And to the point that even, uh, I know I'm, I got to bring it up a little. I know 1976 might have caught some people off guard, but in 1999, maybe that's a little bit closer. Even BB and CC Winans uh, uh, made a song called Heaven, right? And even in their song, Heaven, uh, the song says that they remind us that uh, the streets are paved with gold. And then they say, can you imagine somewhere uh, where life will never end? No one ever grows old. Oh, my brother, please come with me. Uh, uh, I, I mean, and then and then the song keeps going, and then it says, uh, "It's what I live for, a place where love, uh, where, 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 yeah, a place where love would never cease. Uh, I'm willing to die for. Yeah, heaven is where I want to be." And I believe you all that all of us, I mean, there's no person alive. I don't care who it is, whether they Christian, not Christian, believe in God, don't believe in God. I will, will, except for those people who believe that uh, heaven is going to be on earth, right? So with the exception of a few people, I do believe, let me clarify, I do believe that the majority of, of people, if you were to ask them, hey, do you want to go to heaven? You know, not saying you want to go today. You know, and, and let's be clear, I'm not asking not any last one of us, do you want to go today? But at the end of the day, at the end of our life, once we done ran our race, I believe you all, each and every one of us desire to be in heaven. But here's the thing. The more I begin to think about those, the various lyrics to those songs and, and even begin to sing and hum some of those songs and think about some of those lyrics. The more I kept hearing the Holy Spirit ask me, but will they be ready? Everybody desires to go to heaven, right? Just imagine you going on a trip. You know, my mother was going out of town a couple of weeks ago. And I remember asking her uh, the, the day before, have you finished packing? And she's like, no, I ain't even started packing yet. And I'm like, how you how you going to be ready for a trip? And you ain't even packed yet. That and what I mean by that is, yes, you can throw some stuff in a suitcase, but that lets me know that you really haven't put a whole lot of thought into this trip that you're going on. And yes, somebody might say, "Well, you know, I, I could do it at the last minute." Yeah, you could do it at the last minute, but then what are you doing? You end up rushing because you waited till the last minute to try to get ready for something that you knew was coming. Uh, somebody just called where we going with this on today. You knew that it, this trip, my mother knew the trip was coming, but yet she decided, she said, I said, well, mama, why you ain't ready for the trip yet? You told me about this trip like a month and a half ago. She said, yeah, well, you know, I'm going to get ready. She said, what I'm going to do, uh, we leaving out, I think she said, at 5 o'clock in the morning. So what I'm going to do is get up at around 3 o'clock in the morning. And so when I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, because I got to do some straightening and some other stuff, and then I'm going to get my stuff together. And I said, but mama, you know, when you, you got a habit of doing stuff like that. like, but And when you do that, nine times out of ten, you usually end up missing something, right? Oh, man, I forgot this. Oh, I forgot that. Why? Because you were rushing. You waited till the last minute, even though you knew the trip was coming. You, tr you thought that you could properly prepare at the very last minute. 
you all, if we all desire, if heaven is the place that we all desire to be at the end of this life, what are we doing to prepare for it? Are we doing anything to prepare for it? Or do we think that we just going to roll up in that place and be like, hey, party over here. And I and I, I bring this up and I really believe that the reason the Lord brought this up, because I do believe you are. We're living in a day and time when so many people believe that they can do whatever they want to do. Even though in their minds or even with their mouths, they might say heaven is where I want to be. That's my goal. But the question I believe the Holy Spirit kept asking, but will they be ready? Which means the question that I have for us on this morning, will you be ready? So the more that I leaned into trying to understand uh, uh, exactly the extent of, of the message that God was trying to convey to us, he led me to Second Chronicles chapter 24. Now, I'm going to be honest. I thought he would have took me someplace else, like talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. But once I began to read this particular text, I then understood what God was doing. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to, to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 24. I'm going to start reading verse 1, and then I'll let you know when we're going to jump or do whatever. And I'm, again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Verse 1 says, uh, Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. His mother was Zibia from Beersheba. Joash did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight throughout the time of Jehoiada the priest. Verse 3 says, Jehoiada chose two wives for Joash, and he, lay, and he had sons and daughters. Jump down to verse 14 real quick. Jump down to verse 14. Verse 14 says, When all the repairs were finished, they brought the remaining money to the king and Jehoiada. It was used to make various articles for the temple of the Lord, articles for worship services and burnt offerings, including ladles and other articles made of gold and silver. And the burnt offerings were sacrificed continually in the temple of the Lord during the lifetime of Jehoiada the priest. Verse 15 says, Jehoiada lived a very old age, finally dying at 130. He was buried among the kings of the city of David because he had done so much good in Israel for God and his temple. Verse 17 says, but after Jehoiada's death, the leaders of Judah came and bowed before King Joash and persuaded him to listen to their advice. They decided to abandon the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and they worshiped a share of pose and idols instead. Because of this sin, divine anger fell on Judah and Jerusalem. Yet the Lord sent prophets to bring them back to him. The prophets warned them, but still the people would not listen. Verse 20 says, Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada the priest. He stood before the people and said, This is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands and keep yourselves from prospering? You have abandoned the Lord. And now he has abandoned you. Verse 21 said, Then the leaders plotted to kill Zechariah. And Joash and King Joash ordered that they stone him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. Verse 22. That was how King Joash repaid Jehoiada for his loyalty. By killing his son. Zechariah's last words as he died were, may the Lord see what they are doing and avenge my death. Look at verse 23. 
In the spring of the year, the, Ar the Aramean army marched against Joash. They invaded Judah and Jerusalem. And watch this, killed and killed all the leaders of the nation. Then they sent all the plunder. That means all the stuff that they took. They, they sent all the plunder back to their king in Damascus. Verse 24 says, although the Aramaeans attacked with only a small army, the Lord helped them conquer the much larger army of Judah. Because the people of Judah had abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So judgment was carried out against Joash. Verse 25, the Aramaeans withdrew, leaving King Joash severely wounded. But his own officials plotted to kill him for murdering the son of Jehida the priest. They assassinated him as he lay in bed. Then he was buried in the city of David, but not in the royal temple. Our Father and our God, I pray this morning that as we begin to break bread in your word, I pray, Father, that you would allow them to hear more of you, less of me. I pray, Father, that even now that you would begin to stir up your spirit, not only in me, but stir up your spirit within the, your people, Father. I pray that as we break a dive into your word, I pray that you will begin to uh, uh, allow them to hear your voice and hear you clearly, that we all may hear the message that you have set for us. And I pray, Father, that when it's all said and done, you will get glory, you will get honor, you will get all the praise, and your body will be edified. And it's in Jesus' name we all say it, amen. Listen, you all, uh, I, what we just read uh, here in uh, our text, uh, we started out reading uh, about King Joash, uh, be, you know, I mean, well, they just called him Joash in the beginning, but uh, Joash becoming the king of Judah when he was only uh, seven years old. And it tells us that he went on to reign as their king uh, for 40 years. So we mathematic, you know, my math whiz is he started when he was seven years old, right? He became king when he was seven and he was, he remained the king um, until for 40 years, meaning he was 47. Uh, so he was king from the age of seven to 47, right? Um, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm just jumping right in because uh, I got a feeling that I, I, I could end up getting lost in, in I get, when I give some backstory. So I just got to jump right in. And so here in our text, you all, uh, what we see is the Bible goes on um, to give us details. Um, and, and we know that we skip, you know, from verse, uh, we stopped at verse three and then jumped to verse 14. So just let me give that a little backstory or just fill in the blank. So pretty much what ended up happening from verse uh, from four through 13, those verses just literally all it did was describe um, uh, uh, King uh, Joash. Uh, he was moved to rebuild the temple of God. Right. Um, and so that whole all of those verses was Joash uh, beginning to, to put things in place to have the temple rebuilt. Watch this. So much to the point that uh, jo King Joash was getting on the prophet, right? He was getting on his own prophet, Jehida, at one point in time, like, hey, bro, what's going on? How come the temple is not being rebuilt? You know, the, the presence of the Lord needs to have a home, right? <clears throat> and so although it's, it, it, it is significant, but it's not necessarily significant in the context of what we're going, but I just want to make sure I fill in the blank. So if when you have time, feel free to go back, read the whole thing in its entirety on your own. But that's literally all that happened through those verses was there was conversation. They were describing what all the things that transpired in the rebuilding of the temple because uh, King uh, jo Joash 
was concerned and he wanted the temple of God to be rebuilt because the spirit of the Lord uh, needed to have his, his home need to be rebuilt. He needed to have a fresh place, right? It, it was in ruin. And so he wanted to make sure that the temple of the Lord, which is key, because it's going to be a, a you notice this later. Um, he, he wanted to make sure that the temple of the Lord was rebuilt, right? And so here in our text, what we notice, you all, um, the first thing I want to point out uh, as it relates to us being sure um, that we will be ready, watch this, when Jesus returns so that we can all be ready for that trip to heaven. The first thing that I want to point out to you all that we need to do is, number one, if you're writing this down, point number one, we need to do what is pleasing to God. Somebody type that on the screen for me. Do what is pleasing to God. Do what is pleasing to God. If you notice, when we after they finished telling us that you know he became king at seven, um, and he and he went on to be king for forty years, verse two then went on and told us that. And let me make sure I say this. Verse two went on to let us know that the key to to King Joash's success success was that he did what was pleasing to God. Now, why is that important, you all? Uh, 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 it's important because watch this when we do what pleases God not only are we securing our trip to heaven what we're also doing you all is we're ensuring that our life here on earth right that we have a better life and I don't know about y'all but I, I want to have a better life you know I'm, I'm not saying I gotta have a perfect life but I do want the best life that I can possibly have as long as I am inhaling and exhaling air, right? As long as I'm here on this earth, as long as I'm down here and I got, I, I, I want to have a better life. I don't know about you, anybody else that want to have a better life, but that's the key. You are the key to his success was is, it said that he did what was pleasing to God. And so watch this. Like I said, not only do we secure our trip to heaven, but we also have a better life. But what do you mean we have a better life? Because watch this. When we live life God's way, key, I need y'all to hear this part. When we live life God's way, meaning the way God intended, God is then obligated to keep his promises, right? But now, let, let's say somebody don't know what those promises are. I, I'm gonna just give us a few of them, right? Like, like not only does God promise to be with us wherever we go, he also promises to go before us. And so why is that important? Because whenever we go, wherever we go, whatever we do, Right. Uh, God promises, I'm going to go with you. So you ain't going to be going by yourself. But not only am I going to go with you, I'm going to go ahead of you to make sure that the path is clear. Now, how what we might want to consider clear and what God considers clear may not be the same thing. But what we can trust is no matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter what circumstance or situation in life that we find ourselves in, we can trust that God is not only going to go with us, he's going to go before us because he promised it in his word. But, but that ain't it. He then goes on to promise that he would never leave us or forsake us. He even promises to strengthen us and to help us in our time of need. God even promises to uphold us with his righteous right hand. And of course you all, he even promised to keep us in perfect peace. The only thing that we got to do to keep that peace is to keep our minds stayed on him. Like, I mean, let, let's be real. I mean, y'all know me, real talk. Like, come on, y'all. Doing what pleases, I mean, all we got to do is do what pleases God, and he promises to instruct us and teach us in all of the ways that we should go throughout our entire life. Like, like literally, 
the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of everything, 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 the creator of everything promises to instruct us and teach us, promises to protect us, promise to be with us. And all we have to do is to do the things that please him, live our life in a way that pleases him. I don't know about y'all, but that, that, that really does not sound like he's asking too much. As a matter of fact, that sounds like a life cheat code, right? Simply do, do live life the way that God says, and you will have a better life. Now, again, let me clarify. Having a bet, because I think oftentimes uh, we equate better with meaning easy, but that, that's the key. Better does not always mean easy. It usually doesn't. Anybody who, who, who has a better life will tell you they worked hard to get where they are. They went through some things to get where they are. Just because someone has a better life, just some, because someone became successful in a particular area of life, it doesn't mean that they didn't have, that they didn't fall. It doesn't mean that they never failed. No, what it means is they never quit. They persevered. They went through whatever they had to go through until they got there. God promises the same thing. He says, listen, my, my way might not, be, might, might not be easy, but it'll definitely be better. Ouch. <laughs> now, I don't want to take for granted. <laughs> Even when I say, uh, uh, do, you know, when we live our life God's way. I don't want to take for granted that everybody on here or or even on the replay, I don't want to take for granted that every person uh, that might hear this video will understand what it means to do what is pleasing to God. Because somebody might say, well, you know, when they, they hear me say, do what's pleasing to God. Well, I, I try to be a good person. That's good. <laughs> that that That's a good thing that, that you try to be a good person. But let me tell you what the Bible says. Is how we please God. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Uh, uh, let me see, where is it at? Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 6. It says, uh, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So now let me let me let me let me explain that a little bit. Because again, I'm I'm basing my, my explanation based on that maybe there's someone who's hearing this that really doesn't understand some of this church lingo or some of the stuff that we say. So that particular uh verse that we just read, Hebrews chapter 11, when it says it is impossible to please God without faith, that's number one. In other words, if you don't have faith. It is impossible for you to do anything that's going to believe God, that's going to please God. Hear me again, good person or not. You can say I'm a good person all you want, but the Bible tells us that unless you have faith, meaning unless you have faith in him, who is him? God. Unless you have faith in God, it is you will never be able to please him. Why? Because the Bible tells us, and it continues and says, because anybody who comes to God, you got to first believe that he can do everything that he says he can do. <laughs> how, how, okay, how do I make that even easier? There's so many people that say with their mouth, oh yeah, I believe in God, but really, it's not really that they believe God. It's really that they really have a hope, right? Or they have a desire to believe, right? But but when you really have faith, in, and I, and watch this, ooh, ooh, you think you're going to go. That also goes for some Christians. There's some people that can quote you the Bible from front to back, and they will continue to say with their mouth that they believe God. 
But it's not about what we say. It's about how we live. Because if we really truly believe that God is who he says he is, then we will live our we will live our lives in a way that reflects what we believe. As an example, I mean, and I, I I oftentimes when I when I you know I'll use this example when I'm in church, right, in a physical church setting, and you know people come in, and usually when they come in, um, they they put the they coat on the back of the chair or put the purse on the floor on the seat next to them. Then you sit down until it's time to stand up and sing and do whatever the case is. And usually I, I and, and I make it a mental note because I watch what people do when they come in. And I usually point out uh, if I'm, when I give this example that I saw all of y'all come in and I didn't see not one of you all before you sat down. I didn't see not one of y'all grab the chair or the bench, move it, shake it, put a little extra weight on it to test it to see if it will work. No, what most of what 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 a hundred percent of the people do when they come into the church building is they come in, they put their stuff on the seat, and then they simply sit down. Why? Because they see a seat. Watch this, and they believe that that seat or that bench is going to be able to hold them up. Now, for some others who maybe that's not their case, maybe they didn't think about the bench. That, but what they did do was they saw other people sitting down, and because they were sitting down, they then believed, well, if it can hold them up, it can hold me up. That's an example of faith. So here's a question, and, and which is where I'm going with this. How often do we just simply live our lives based on what God says because we believe, well, if God did it for them, He'll do it for me. But let's be honest. That's not how most people live their lives. If I'm comparing, we doubt God more than we doubt the chair that we might that we sit on. There's somebody right now. You may have went to your desk to sit down at your desk. You might be sitting, sitting on your couch. You, and, and because you sat on the couch yesterday, and the day before that, and it held you up. It didn't fall apart. You didn't think twice when you got up about the fact that it will hold you up right now. Ouch. But yet, you say you believe in God. But there's some things that God may have instructed you to do, either directly or through his word. There's some things that God may have instructed you to do. But yet you haven't done it. The question is why? Is it because you really don't believe? Whew. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. But here's the thing. Regardless of where you are, right? The, the point number one is we have to do what pleases God. And for those of you who, if you're unsaved, you're watching this, you don't know God, you're not even sure if you have a right relationship with God, we're going to get to that at the end of this. But I just want to tell you, even now, uh, when it comes to uh, doing what pleases God, if you don't know anything else to do, a good place to start if you're taking notes would be Psalms chapter 63, and I'm just going to read verse 1. You can read all of uh, Psalm 63, but in particular, um, a good place to start, I'm going to suggest Psalms chapter 63, verse 1, where most of us know the story of David and Goliath. So David, uh, who's the author of Psalms, um, in this particular Psalm, David also is the only person the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart. So in Psalm 63, verse 1, where I suggest you start, if, uh, uh, David, uh, after the Bible, who, who the, a little sometimes, who the Bible describes as being a man after God's own heart, he describes this uh, in, 16, in Psalm 63. This is his way of seeking God, right, or, or in trying to please God. It says, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. 
my soul thirsty, thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So I have seen thee in the sanctuary. And the reason I say it start there because well, he's giving an example of how he, he starts seeking God when? Early. The first thing that we should do when we get up is seek God. And what, is it, what does it mean, seek God? In other words, before we make any decisions, before we do anything, we should be seeking God. That's why prayer is important. Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is not just a place where you go and tell God all your problems. Yes, you do tell God your problems. But prayer is not only you telling God your problem. Prayer is also the opportunity for you to sit in peace and in silence meditating and allow God to download to you. Right? So in order to get to that place where we can know what it means to please God, you got to start by seeking him first. Talk to him. He can tell you what he wants you to do. He can tell you what he desires from you. So that's a good place to start. But I got to keep moving. I got to get I got to keep moving. My second point you all, my second point. The second thing that we need to do uh to be ready, watch this. When Jesus returns so that we can we can secure our trip to heaven is we need to understand if you're writing down point number two, understand that your circle, your community and your environment matters. Point number two, understand that your circle, your community, your envi and your environment matters. Now, watch this. I don't know if y'all noticed. But our text made sure to point out on two separate occasions that King Joash did what was pleasing to God as long as uh, Jehoiada the priest was alive. <clears throat> and the reason I, I want to point this out to you all as I get ready, to, now I'm getting ready to give us a little backstory. This is important because remember, Joash became king when he was seven and he remained the king for 40 years. So that means he was king from the age of seven to 47. But I need to give y'all a little backstory to find out how did we get here? How, how did we get to the place of this, this young man, Joash, becoming a king at age seven? It's about to get good, y'all. So now, if you go back, now, I, I mean, it's I went, I stopped at, at chapter twenty-two, going back because I I was found myself going down this rabbit hole. But I, I got to give context. So here's the thing: right now, our text we're talking about King Joash again. He became king, became the king at age seven, but now. Prior to him becoming king, he was hidden away and raised, watch this, he was raised in the temple with King, uh, I mean, with, with, with Jehoiada the priest and all, you know, within the temple and his mom, they raised him with inside of the, inside of the temple. Why? <laughs> Here's the thing. Joash's grandmother, not his mama, Joash's grandmother was actually reigning as the monarch of Judah for that for seven years. I don't know if y'all heard it. Joash's grandmother was the reigning monarch in Judah for seven years. So the seven years leading up to, for seven years leading up to Joash take it over. His grandmother was in charge. But Joash had been living within the temple. Why? Here we go. So watch this. Joash is the son of King Ahaziah. King Ahaz Ahaziah 
is the son of King Jehoram. King Jehoram is the son of King Josephat. So here's where, where, here's where the plot thickens. When King Jehoshaphat died, uh, he had seven sons. Uh, Jehoram was one of the seven sons. As a matter of fact, he was the oldest of Jehoshaphat's seven sons. So when King Jehoshaphat died, Jehoram took over as the, as the new reigning king. He was 32 years old when he took over. So now, when Jehoram took over as the king, he decided to follow in, in the paths or use the, or live in the shadows and the examples of other kings like Ahab. Why is that important? We're going to talk about it. And so once Jehoram became king, he then killed his other six brothers. Now, why would he do that? He, would, he killed his other brothers because he wanted to ensure that if anything ever happened to me, intentionally or unintentionally, none of them could take over. Because So he wanted to ensure that I'm going to be, the, be king for as long as I can. So watch this. So he killed his six brothers. And then he made a choice to marry one of Ahab. Remember, Ahab was an evil king. Ahab was an enemy of God. He was considered to be very wicked. But this is the pattern of kingship that Jehoram was, was going after or patterning himself after. So in that same pattern, he then chose to marry one of Ahab's daughter, who was and the daughter's name was Athaliah. Athaliah is the grandmother that I'm talking about that was reigning for the seven years as a monarch, you know, while uh, Joash was living in the temple. So now let's break that down. So how did we get to if, if Athelia is married to Jehoram, how did we get to Athelia being the monarch and running everything? Here's the thing. The, uh, King Jehoram and Athelia, when they got married, they had a son named Ahaziah. Remember, I started that out earlier. And the thing, well, let me back up because there's another little significant piece I need y'all to see. Also, when it comes to Athelia, her, her mother, remember, we already know her father is Ahab. Her mother is Jezebel. Now, I know I don't have to say a whole lot about that because most of us already know we have enough information about Jezebel to know Jezebel was a wicked and evil manipulator. That's her mama. So her daddy was a wicked and evil king, and her mama was evil and manipulative also. That's where Athelia came from. So now, Athelia and Jehoram have a son named Ahaziah. Because what ends up happening, because Jehoram decided to go the path of wickedness, God then sent him a warning and said, listen, because you're leading my people astray, right? You're going to, you, I'm going to inflict pain upon you. My people, your people and everybody connected to you are going to end up suffering and you're going to suffer the most because you're going to fall ill and, you, and, and that's going to be the end of you, which is what ends up happening. So Je, uh, Jehoram only was king for eight years. But the last of his of his, the last year or two of his time, uh, he was deathly ill. Right, he had some kind of in in, in, in uh, intestinal disease that ultimately killed him. So, but because they had a son, watch this: the son took over, which is that that's normal, right? And so, when Ahaziah took over as king, his mother Athelia. Was was the person in his ear? She, the way she raised him, she was raising him in the way of wickedness. She was raising him to be more like her, like his father. And watch this: as a result of listening to his mother and her wicked ways, Ahaziah was only king for one year, and God removed his covering and anointing over him. And he ended up being killed. 
once he was killed. Watch this. Once Ahaziah was killed, his mother, which is a failure, then decided to kill everyone else in her son's lineage. Why? Because now she decided she's going to just take over the throne. Mm -hmm. Don't that sound like a TV show? The, here it is, a failure decides I'm just going to assume command. So she decides to kill everybody connected and that's related to her son. But, somebody say but. But God spared Joash. So when he was just a little bitty baby, he was taken away and hidden inside the temple. And the Bible says that Joash was raised inside of the temple for those six, seven, those six years, going into that seventh year. And when his seventh year came, the prophet Jehoiada met with other leaders and let them know, listen, this is what God wants. The, the, the prophecy that God has is going to, uh, when, as it pertains to the bloodline of David, that prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And it's going to start with Joash. So what they decided to do was once he turned seven, they then crowned him king. That's where chapter 24 picks up at. They then crowned him king. If you were to go back and read chapter 20, I believe it's in chapter 23, what you end up finding out is once they then declare him to be the king, right? Because Jehoiada of the priest, he has the respect um, an honor from the other leaders. And so when he speaks, you know, they, they, hey, clearly this is what God is saying. And so what happens is once he became, once they made him king, the, the grandmother of Thalia attempted to come to the temple. And why? Because she was, she was upset because she felt like they would, they would, uh, uh, it was treacherous of them to anoint or make someone else king while she was still ruling, although she had no business ruling. And so the, it, it, what ends up happening is they end up killing her. But so now, how do we, this is how we get to point number two, which is, remember, point number two is we need to understand that your circle, your community, and your environment matters. Because when chapter four, chapter 24 picks up, it tells us on more on, on a couple of occasions that watch this, while uh, Jehoiada the priest was alive, right? Uh, uh, Joash was raised in the temple, meaning he was raised in the ways of the Lord. And, and when you go back and read verses 3 through 14, you see he was passionate about rebuilding the temple, right? But as long as he had those safeguards, as long as he was in the right environment, as long as he had the right people around him, he did what was pleasing to the Lord. But what we read in our text, you all, which is which is what I want to point out to us. Once we get to a certain point in the text, once uh, uh, Jehoiada the priest died, the Bible, what we read in our text was, the Bible said that the other leaders within the camp, they began to come to the king and say, hey, king. Because now watch this, because you better believe the enemy is watching who's in your circle. The enemy is watching who's in your community and watching your environment. And he's looking for a foothold. He's looking for an opportunity to just slip in there so that he can plant some seeds of doubt. And the Bible says that when, when uh, Jehoiada the priest died, don't take my word for it. Let's go to it. I, I, I want to go to. I don't want you to take my word. Let me let me pull it up. Let me go back to it. All right, here it is. Here it is. Verse seventeen says, "But after Jehoiada's death, the leaders of Judah came and bowed before King Joash, and persuaded him to listen to their advice." That in verse eighteen says. They decided, they decided to abandon the temple of the Lord, which is interesting to me. 
the very thing that now I'm not saying that uh, Jehoiada the priest didn't want the temple built, but the, the the temple being built was because King Joash wanted the temple built because he said, "Listen, the presence of the Lord has to have a home. We got to rebuild the temple." To the point that he was even getting on his own priest, Jehoiada, the person who shepherded him, the person who raised him. Amen. Why you ain't saying nothing to the people? We got to get this done. Our God needs a home. We got to get to the business of rebuilding the Lord's temple. But once his environment changed, once Jehoiada died, once his circle shifted, once his community was altered, they, it says that the, the leaders, they crept in and they persuaded him to listen to their advice. And they decided, they, they hear this, they tell him the king, we should just abandon the temple. And we need to go back to worshiping the other gods, right? We need to go back to worshiping Asherah and, and, and some of these other idol gods. And the Bible says that King Joash listened to them. You all, I don't know how much I can stress who you have speaking into your ear. Who, who you have in your circle, who you align yourself with. Brother, it's a community of believers. The environment that you frequent, it all shapes and helps to form our perspective. Watch this. And all it takes is a, is a small moment of weakness for us to then make a decision that goes completely contrary to what we said we believe. And watch this. I, I, and I'm trans. I mean, I got to be honest because we. I understand that we all human, right? I understand that you know nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. But can I be honest? When we were, when all of us were growing up, all of us are products. That we were direct products of our environment, because as kids. We didn't have control or in any kid. They typically, you don't have control over the environment where you were raised. You don't have any control over the traditions or rituals or practices that you may partake in. We simply are, are expected to do whatever our parent or guardian told us to do or said. However, the moment we came of age, in other words, the moment we became a legal adult, we got to understand, regardless of how we were raised, regardless of what we were taught, the moment we come of age, our environment, our community, our circle, it became our responsibility. In our text, Joash had a choice to make. Yes, these other leaders came and, and they put something in his ear. They planted little seeds in his ear. And he, and he chose, watch this, he made, and as an adult, raised a certain kind of way. He made the choice to agree with them. How do you know? Here's how we know. Let me go. Let me let me go back to our text. The Bible says, uh, verse at verse eighteen said they decided to abandon the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and they worship a share of poles and idols instead. And watch this. Because of this, because of this sin, divine anger fell on Judah and Jerusalem. And verse 19 says, yet, because God always gives us a way of escape, you all. 
verse 19 says, yet the Lord sent prophets to bring them back to him. The prophets warned them, but still the people wouldn't listen. Mm. So let's look at verse 20. Then the spirit of God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada. So in other words, the spirit of the Lord then decided at, at the sending other priests and they wouldn't listen. I hope y'all hearing this. After sending other priests and prophets and the people wouldn't listen, the spirit of the Lord then came upon Zechariah, who is the son of Jehoiada, Jeho the priest that died. Now, remember, clearly uh, King Joash loved and respected Jehoiada the prophet because the Bible, remember, the Bible told us as long as Jehoiada the prophet was alive, King Joash did whatever was pleasing to God. So now, once King Joash had his circle began to influence him, his community began to, to deteriorate, right? His environment began to alter how he saw things and did things, how he moved. The Bible says in verse 20, the spirit of God came upon Zechariah, who's the son of Jehoiada the priest, meaning, if nothing else, out of respect for the man that you love and that you respected. And clearly, I would imagine you had to have known his son. The Bible says that the spirit of God came upon and moved upon Zechariah. After not listening to all the other priests. Mm. And here's what Zechariah had to say. He stood before the people and said, this is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands and keep yourself from prospering? You have abandoned the Lord. And now he has abandoned you. But verse 21 says, then the leaders plotted to kill Zechariah, just like the enemy. But it goes on and says, and King Joash ordered that they stone him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. In other words, don't take him out to the side and kill him. Kill him right there in the middle, in the foyer of the church. I, I can't reiterate you all enough. Point number two. Our circle, our community, our environment matters. It can affect whether or not we make it to heaven if that's where we want to be. Because if our goal is to live our life the way that God desires us to do, if, if our goal is to live a life pleasing to God, that means we should have the right circle around us the right community around us. That means we need, to, we need to be in the right environment to help us, watch this, not to help us be accountable in living the way that God desires, designed us to be. Because ultimately, when you don't have the right circle around you, when you're not in the right community, when you're not in the in, in the the right environment, what ends up happening is we begin to live not only contrary to God, but God is no longer obligated to walk with us. And just as God removed His covering from Joash's uh, ancestors, watch this. The same happened to him, which is the warning that Zechariah gave him. Because if you keep it, when we keep going down. And after we read, we just read verse 21, where the leaders plotted to kill Zechariah and King Joash gave the order. He, he gave the green light. I want to jump down to verse 23. Because I want what ended up happening after that. 
It says, verse 23 says, in the spring of the year, the Aramean army marched against Joash. They invaded Judah and Jerusalem and killed all the leaders of the nation. So, so in other words, all those people that talked King Joash into turning his back on God, on the temple and God. Another God used another army to come in, invade them, killed all of the leaders. Then they took all of their stuff, all of their plunder. Took the, they took everything, gave it to their king. <clears throat> well, watch this. Look at verse 24. Although the Aramans attacked only, attacked with only a small army, the Lord Help them conquer a much larger army of Judah. I want to put a pen in this right in that right there. Because I want to ask the question to many of us. Some of the battles that we have engaged in, whether it was spiritual warfare or natural, I wonder, don't answer right now, but I wonder. Is it because we turned our back on God? Could it be that maybe God removed the, the protective covering over us because we turned our back on him? And that was God's way of, of, of allowing us to reap what we sowed. Could it be that the reason that some of our stuff that we, that, you know, we sing these songs, I'm going to the enemy's camp, take back what he took from us. Could it be that God allowed them to take it? Because we no longer were living our life in a way that was pleasing to God. We were no longer living our life. Is it possible that we were no longer living our life in a way that would ensure that we would get to the place that we want to be, which is heaven? I could keep going, but I'm not. I got to land this plane. So the third thing, you all, the third thing that we need to be sure to ensure that we get our ticket to heaven, if that's the place that you want to be. The Bible says that the only way to be sure, the only way to get to the Father is through his son, Jesus. Just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know the story. He died and he rose with all power in his hands. He died for our sins. So if he died for our sins, how then do we repay him? We repay him by living a life that's pleasing to God. But we start with, you have to accept Jesus as the only way into heaven. We have to understand, you all, that no man, the Bible tells us, no man comes to the Father but by Jesus. At the end of the day, point number one, living a life pleasing to God. Point number two, having the right circle, community, environment. None of that stuff will be effective. None of that stuff matters. If we don't have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Thankfully, watch this. The Bible don't make it real difficult to even accept him as our Lord and Savior. It's real simple. You can repeat this prayer after me. The Bible says that whomever confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart. Why do they say say with your mouth? Because publicly, they, it's a public outward sign of what you say that you believe with your heart. Now, I got to be, be clear. What you believe with your heart is going to show based on how you live. 
You won't be able to live pleasing to God if you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior. So if you want to be sure, if heaven is where you want to be, if you want to be ready on that day when Jesus comes back, Simply repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And I can't do this thing called life without you. I acknowledge that the only way for me to get to heaven, the only way for me to get to our Father, the only way for me to get to the king is through you. So I surrender my will, come in, take over. I give you complete control. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, that's the first step, right? That's the first step in preparation accepting Jesus as the only way to get to heaven. The second thing that you will have to do is then start reading up in his word so that you can start figuring out how do I go about pleasing God on a daily basis. And as you begin that journey, and guess what? Even if you've fallen off the journey, because there's guess what? There's a lot of folks in church. They fell off that journey. They talk it. <coughs> but they're not living it with their heart. They just talking it. So even if you've fallen off the wagon, get back on there. Begin to start that journey back up of living a life pleasing to God. And as you begin to do that, build, develop, and grow your circle. Make sure that you're in the right community. Make sure that you guard your environment. Because I don't know about you, I, I, I do agree. Heaven is where I want to be. And I plan to be ready. But will you? Listen, that's all I got for y'all on today. I know I went a little bit long, but I pray that this message blessed somebody Um. And do me a favor, um, tag some folks in the chat that you know need to hear this, share this video with somebody, because I don't know about you, but you know, when I go on trips, I don't, I, I sometimes I like for other people to go. And so I would hate uh, for us to all be prepared when Jesus comes back. But then there's some people that we know uh, they ain't living a life pleasing to God. There's some people that we know um, that their circle, their community, their environment, right, is what also what's helping contribute um, to them not living a, peace, a peaceful life. But then also there's some people that simply haven't started the step of accepting Jesus as the only way to heaven. They need to hear this message. So go ahead and share this, tag this with them. You know, leave us some comments, some hearts in, in the chat. And uh, as always, I love y'all. There's nothing you can do about it. Until next time, I love y'all. Peace out.